guys, welcome back to Rooted Homeschool. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about the three main ways that I foster a love of reading in my children and in our family and just the culture of reading in our home. So the first one, if you watched episode two, um, the first one you got to see in action where I just put out a handful of books about a particular topic, either on the kitchen table or in the living room. They can just feel free like, this is your time to explore these books and enjoy. If we're learning about space, obviously there are different topics related to space. So if we're learning about the sun that day, then I'll pull a whole bunch of books that kind of connect in some way to the sun. And so sometimes it might be nonfiction texts that do give some facts about the sun and have some photographs and things like that. But other times it might be fictional texts mixed in there for them to be able to just engage with that topic through stories. Human beings love stories, like everyone gets connected through stories. So if you can foster a love of stories, then you can really like hook your kids and engage them in books. So I always make sure that there are fiction texts as well as nonfiction texts and kind of a nice mix for them to engage with the topic. So sometimes it'll be our main unit that I choose books for them to engage with for that reading time. And then other times it might be just something that we wanna learn about that particular day. So for example, on Martin Luther King Day, I put out a whole bunch of books that were related to Martin Luther King and they were able to explore those books that way. There's always some kind of connection, some kind of relatedness, just to get to pique their interest. Second way that I love to foster a love of reading is through poetry tea time. Poetry tea time is a concept that I read about in the book, The Brave Learner. And if you have not read that book, I strongly recommend that you read it. It is so inspiring. And I'll also be talking about that and a whole bunch of other books in my next video that, I, that are like must reads. Where she talks about poetry tea time and just turning poetry into like a really just cozy, fun, engaging atmosphere, right? You set out tea and you set out candles and maybe you set out some treats. So sometimes when we do poetry tea time, it'll just be poetry books. Introduction to poetry and William Shakespeare and different poets. Other times, like today, we're doing a poetry tea time which connects to space. So we'll have a couple of books that are space poetry books that they can engage with that way. And then there'll also be a mix of other just books on poetry. We did our poetry tea time for Martin Luther King Day. It was books by African American poets. You can just totally grab random poetry books and let them have at it and have fun with it. Or you could make it themed surrounding a topic. So although this started out as poetry tea time, it's also evolved in other ways and they all kind of work to continue fostering that love of reading. So I'll give you an example. Maybe you're like, my kids are not gonna read poetry. Like, I don't know what you're talking about, lady. They're not gonna read poetry. First of all, I'm gonna push back a little bit and say, yes, they will. Like if you make it exciting and you get the right stuff, like my 13 year old discovered where the sidewalk ends he loves Shel Silverstein and the way that that happened is one morning I was sitting on the couch drinking tea with my five-year-old who was the only one up and we decided we wanted to try poetry tea time for the first time but guess what I'm embarrassed to say we didn't have any poetry in the house but I was so determined to do it that I looked up some poetry videos on YouTube because I'm like surely there's some poetry videos and we found um, where the sidewalk ends and we had this book at some point I searched all over the house, like even in my son's room who were still sleeping, um, thinking it was in their room. I was like sneaking around trying to find this book and I just could not find it. So I broke down and we watched poetry on YouTube. My 13 year old came down in the middle of it, cuddled up on the couch and was fixed on it, like wanted to watch more and more. And finally he said, I wonder if we could find a video of Shel Silverstein reading his poetry, because at this point it was just like some random woman who was doing a great job, but I was like, good idea. So we looked it up and we found it. And obviously if you haven't, I recommend that you do it. It was amazing. We were laughing out loud, we were smiling. 
Everybody in the entire family by the time it was over ended up in the living room wanting to be a part of what we were doing and it was such a great time. I think I'll remember it always. So I found this book called I'm Just No Good at Rhyming and Other Nonsense for Mischievous Kids and Immature Grownups. This is the book that you need to get your kids interested in poetry, especially if you have like a middle schooler, especially if you have a middle school boy. It is hysterical. We did poetry tea time with this today. He didn't even want to give anyone a turn with it, but he was so into it. He read this book for a solid hour, sitting on the floor, drinking his tea, and I didn't want to stop that. So I was basically like, everybody else can read this another time. This is definitely a book that you want to get if you want to get your kids into poetry and you don't know where to start, this is a good place to start. So I, like I said, I would push back and say, yes, they will love poetry. But if you don't believe me and you feel like you need to start somewhere else, We've also done magazine and smoothie time. So we've done taking all the magazines in our house. Some of them are National Geographic. Some of them are highlights magazines that we've saved up over, over time. Some of them are like Better Homes and Gardens. Some of them have to do with money, like random magazines that people have, have dropped off to us. Some that we have subscribed to like nature magazines. And we just sit and we read magazines and we drink smoothies and they love that too. And the idea is like, there's no assignment that you have to do afterwards. Like you're reading for the sake of reading and for the joy of reading. And they always share something that they loved or something that they thought was cool or funny or inspiring. So that's a great place to start if you're like poetry scares you a little bit. But I think you'll surprise yourself and your kids will surprise you if you try poetry tea time. I can write in cursive now. I, I just wrote a sentence in cursive. Awesome. Wow, Jax. Read Look the sentence. Look at that improvement. Can you read it to me? I'm not. Oh. <laughs> What's the sentence? <laughs> and then this is what I wrote by myself. <laughs> You're proud of yourself? So while the kids were working on their um, cursive and their copy work, um, I set up a little poetry tea time for them in here on the living room floor. Sometimes we do it at the kitchen table. Sometimes we do it on the floor. Sometimes we'll do it over on the couch. Um, but they'll just kind of be able to have these big floor pillows. I have some tea for them, a little treat, some oranges, and then a mix of different books, some to go with our space unit. So I have like this out of the world, poems and facts about space. And then also to go along with the space one, I have Night Wonders, which is poetry about space. But then I also just have general poetry books like A Child's Introduction to Poetry. I'm Just No Good at Rhyming and Other Nonsense for Mischievous Kids and Immature Grownups. I think that one's gonna be a fun, like Shel Silverstein type of vibe. Then um, Poetry for Kids, William Shakespeare, which is a beautifully illustrated um, poetry book. And then this one I'm really excited about. Um, this is a nice big book. It's called The Lost Words. And this has beautiful illustrations as well. So I'll show you guys those illustrations in just a minute. So this is quickly has become one of my favorite poetry books. This is a really big book, which I'm excited about. I didn't realize it when I took it out of the library um because i ordered it online but i was excited about it anyway just because of the concept this book was written with the intent to bring back the lost words or the words um, that have been taken out of the junior dictionaries and replaced with words um you know that connect with like the digital world and technology and so i just really loved this concept of bringing those 
words from the natural world back into the vocabulary of children. Um, and it just has absolutely beautiful illustrations, which is really great anyway, and can kind of, you know, touch on some art study just informally, which I love. And um, my kids really appreciate illustrations, so that's pretty cool. Um, and then for my five-year-old, who isn't quite reading yet, she's just learning some sight words and things. She can have fun looking at the letters and the illustrations as she gets comfortable with books and with reading. So it's really, I mean, I would sit here and read this whole book by myself and in, fully enjoy it. So that's usually a good indication that it's a great book. So remember guys, during our poetry tea time, you can just relax and read and drink your tea and enjoy your treats. But if there's something that you really love at any time, you can share it with us. Which I'm really excited about, um, because I think it's pretty cool. But the reason I got it is because of this. I'm gonna read it to you on the back. It says, when the most recent edition of the Oxford Junior Dictionary, widely used in schools around the world, was published, a sharp-eyed reader soon noticed that around 40 common words concerning nature had been dropped. The words were no longer being used enough by children to merit their place in the dictionary. The list of these lost words included acorn, adder, bluebell, dandelion, fern, heron, kingfisher, newt, otter, and willow. Among the words taking their place, listen to this guys, were attachment, blog, broadband, bullet point, cut and paste, and voicemail. The news of these substitutions, the outdoor and natural being displaced by the indoor and virtual, became seen by many as a powerful sign of the growing gulf between children and the natural childhood and the natural world. In response, Robert McFarlane and Jackie Morris set out to make a spell book that would conjure back 20 of these lost words and the beings they named from acorn to red. By the magic of word and paint, they sought to summon these words again into the voices, stories, and dreams of children and adults alike and to celebrate the wonder and importance of everyday nature. You hold that book in your hands, a book that has already cast its extraordinary spell on hundreds of thousands of people and begun a grassroots movement to rewild childhood across Britain, Europe, and North America. So this book is attempt to bring back like words that are starting to become lost. This one says, dazzle me, little son of the grass, and spin me, tiny time machine. Now this is an acrostic, guys. Do you see this, mm -hmm. Gage? Do you know what an acrostic poem is? It's when you take the first letter of, or each letter of a word, and you use that as the first letter of the line of the poem. So this poem is called Dandelion, and look at So see how dandelion is spelled out here? And then the same letters are used as the first line of each line of the, the first letter it's of each line. Of the poem. Yeah, so it says D, dazzle me, little son of the grass. And spin me, tiny time machine, tick tock, sun clock, thistle and dock. Now no longer known as dent de lion, lion's tooth or wind blow, tick tock, sun clock, metal and dock. Evening glow, milk witch or parachute. So let new names take and root, thrive and grow. Tick tock, sun clock, rattle and dock. I would make you some, such as bane of lawn perfectionists, or fallen star of the football pitch of scatter seed, but Never would I call you only, merely, simply, weed. Tick tock, sun clock, clover and dock. I like this one. I would make you some, such as bane of lawn perfectionists. Meaning like, people who are like perfectionists about their lawns hate like dandelions. Them. I actually love them and those little purple flower weeds that grow up in our lawn. Cause they're just really pretty like the purple. So another really cool book. Um, for Poetry Tea Time is um, this Poetry for Kids, William Shakespeare book, and it blends William Shakespeare's works with beautiful um, illustrations. This is a child's introduction to poetry. And so this is a nice living book. So a living book just kind of um, is a way to learn about something or teach your kids something um, without a textbook or without, you know, um, a specific lesson. And so this one, as much as I love books that are just books of beautiful poetry to enjoy, this one includes like um, bios of particular authors, um, information about different types of poetry. For example, this page um, explains what free verse is and then gives an example of free mm -hmm. verse. Yes, Gia. I love willow too. All right, let me see. 
That thing is falling out today for sure. Yeah. So this is a really cool book. This is called Night Wonders and every page has a short poem about the type of thing that is happening in the sky and then some um, factual information about it. So it's a really, really cool um, way to blend the poetry and the nonfiction element together. And then there are also the images um, and there's a glossary in the back. It's just a really, really cool book, especially if you're studying space or even if you're not, just a cool way to blend some poetry and nonfiction into your learning. This is the book I was waiting to book talk last because Justice was reading it the entire time, maybe over an hour now. Um, but I figured since he loves it so much, maybe to let him book talk it. So he's going to tell you about this book. Yeah, I really like it. It's like got a lot of like pretty funny stuff in it and um, and stuff just kind of like this one called the Infinity Poem. It's just like the words are in a circle and if you read it, it kind of makes sense like you could keep reading it. Like it goes, a poet who didn't know what she should write it looked down at her page. The page was all white. She thought, I should write about something I know. Then she started her poem like so, and then it restarts. That's really poem, cool. Yeah, and and then another spot is like over here. The page numbers are perfectly, uh, purposely off. For example, it skips from 77 to 79 <laughs> over here, and then from 79 to 90. That's really um, funny. If we keep going, it goes from 97 to 99. That's pretty funny. Can you show them the name of the book? Because then it'll start to make sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's called I'm Just No Good at Rhyming and Other Nonsense from Mischievous Kids and Immature Grown Ups. So it's like really a really fun book. And I got this specifically thinking of Justice because he loves Shel Silverstein so much. And it has that same vibe. What light is light if Sylvia be not seen? What joy is joy if Sylvia be not by? Unless it is to think that she is by and feed upon the shadow of perfection, except I be by Sylvia in the moon. There is no music in the night in the nightingale, unless I look on Sylvia in, in the day. There is no day for me to look upon. Mm, that's pretty beautiful, huh? Everyone is losable, every worker is possible, every cookie is tossable, every yuck is lossable. Nothing is impossible, child. Nothing is impossible. Okay, teacher, can you name something that isn't possible? No, child, nothing is impossible. So there is something that's impossible. Naming something that's impossible is impossible. Well, um, I guess, child, in that case, it is possible to name something that is impossible because naming something that's impossible is possible, but then naming something that's impossible is not impossible. It's possible, which means it is po impossible <laughs> to name something that's impossible. So, child, I, uh, look, I've got a lot of inspiring to do, so you get to the point. What's your question? Okay, if everything is possible, then is it possible to name something that is not possible? No. Yes. No. No. Yes. Yes. No. Maybe. Oh, wait. Never. Uh, <laughs> At this point, the teacher's head exploded, and the child got teacher brains all over her new dress. <laughs> it was really, really gross and cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Sethi, what are you doing? Are you having some tea? Huh? Yummy. Is it good? Mm. Sethi, what do you see on this book? What's on the book? Um, oh. What's this? Is that a bird? Yeah. What do birds say? Beep. Tweet, tweet. Beep. 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 You're silly. Whoa. What's that? What is that? Beep. Beep. Is that Beep. another bird? Yes. Yeah. Beep. My bottom tooth came out. Good job, Deej. I put my tooth in my in the bag. And where'd you put the bag? In mommy's desk, on mommy's desk, in her room. What are you hoping happens? That I can put it upstairs in the toothpaste, mm -hmm. get me money. The third thing that I want to talk to you about today for how you can foster a love of reading in your family with your children is read aloud time. This one I feel like is overlooked and sometimes only considered something that you do with younger children and can really get lost um, when you have older kids or when you're a busy family. And this one is, I feel, 
the simplest way to not only foster a love of reading and a love of stories, but really like foster that feeling of togetherness, which we're all about. I stumbled across the book, The Read Aloud Family, which I'll talk more about in my next video, which is my top 10 favorite homeschool and parenting books. Um, so be on the lookout for that. But um, in that book, Sarah McKenzie talks about all of the many benefits that come from reading aloud as a habit in your family. So I mentioned in my last video that I'm a 10th grade English teacher. I also am one class away from being a literacy specialist. So I still need to take that one last class. So I know so much about reading and I know so much about books and so much about writing. But I have to tell you, this book by Sarah McKenzie, I learned so much and in a different way about how important it is to read aloud to your children. But I just want to tell you how simple this is. Let them pick a book or pick a book together as a family. If you already have one in your house, pick one. If you've already read it and they want to read it again, go for it. Sandy, come here. Okay, so Gigi, you voted for poetry, so I'm going to read this poem for you. Okay? And this is called Ferns. Ferns first form is furled. Each frond fast as a fiddlehead. Reach, roll, an unfold follows. Fern flares. Now fern is fully fanned. So did you guys catch what this what this poem is about with the fern? Was it about uh, sprouting up and stuff? Yeah, it's about how it starts and how it grows and when it's when it's fully Research the top ten books for your kids' age groups. Ask them, like, hey, I have a challenge for you. Find an interesting book that we want to read together as a family and make it fun. Like you could still make the tea, make the hot chocolate. We do that sometimes and cuddle up on the couch and just read a good book. This could be a picture book. It could be a chapter book that takes you months to finish. Either way, your kids will love it and so will you. Shared stories and kind of like that shared experience, even though it's not something you're really experiencing, you're experiencing things through the lens of a character, you guys will make those connections and and talk about those things probably for the rest of your lives. They'll randomly come up when other things connect with it in life. So hopefully seeing some of these things in action today um, poetry tea time, as well as reading time at the table with books and read alouds as a family will help give you some ideas and inspire you to implement some of these things in your family. So if you're homeschooling, obviously this is something that you're going to want to do, but you don't have to homeschool to have this culture of reading in your family. It is going to benefit your family, whether you're homeschoolers, whether your kids are in traditional school, whether they're virtual learning or whatever it may be. So if you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, subscribe to our channel and share this video with someone who you think could benefit from learning how to foster a love of reading in their family. No matter how busy we get doing chores around the house or whether we're doing the lesson, we always make sure that the focus is treating each other the right way. Sometimes the dishes get piled up, the laundry's backed up, and there's garbage that needs to be taken out, and the rooms get dirty, or there's arguments, all kinds of stuff. But we always make sure that at the end of the day, we come together for a family devotional time where we pray, worship, and everyone goes to bed at peace with each other. I can honestly say that this has been one of the funnest times I think we'll ever have in our life, the kids being schooled at home. Like everyone was making everyone laugh and stuff. And um, there's good vibes and